KCDC On Air. The podcast of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Good morning and welcome to ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. My name is Catherine and today I'm your host for this podcast recorded from our headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. In this episode, we are going to talk about infectious disease surveillance and monitoring. To carry out this activity, ECDC collects, analyzes, and disseminates surveillance data on 56 communicable diseases and related health issues. One of our previous podcasts, entitled This is Data Hub, describes in detail this surveillance activity, the type of data involved, where it comes from, and how ECDC uses and share it back. ECDC is now looking to help countries improve their surveillance systems and therefore the surveillance of infectious disease at European level by using clinical health data, data that are already present in countries' health information systems. What is this data? How will it help to improve the surveillance and control of infectious disease at European level? These are the themes of our discussion. With us today, we have Carlos Carvalho, who works at ECDC as an expert in digital surveillance. Good morning, Carlos. Good morning, Catherine. Nice to have you here. Can you tell us more about yourself? What is your background? Thanks for having me here. So I'm a medical epidemiologist from Portugal. I have been working in public health for a while now, finished my training in public health, and I've been uh, working while, while I was in Portugal mainly in surveillance of tuberculosis. I did my field epidemiology training in London in 2011 then went back to Portugal and worked in general public health functions, but focusing mostly on epidemiology of infectious diseases. And then in 2020, I joined ECDC as an expert in surveillance. So Carlos, what are you currently doing at ECDC? I'm uh, working mainly on one project that is on digitalization of the surveillance process. This term is very generic and it entails different things. The digitalization started from replacing paper forms with new computerized records. So this was done already. But there are still many manual steps in the process of notifying diseases to us at the CDC or to public health services in general, regardless of the level. Currently, most countries are collecting the data they need on the uh, set of infectious diseases and reporting it to us through the tool that we have in place, which is TESI. So this is a structured data collection using mostly a file that is sent our way. But it still relies on a manual step of notification of a disease from a clinician, from a doctor that suspects and diagnoses an infectious disease in a patient. What you mean, if I understand well, digital surveillance will mean that we don't have any human step in the digitalization of data. It will be all automatic. That's the ultimate goal. We okay. cannot, we cannot say that we will achieve this in the short term. This is a long-term project and uh, all countries have been working on this. The legislation has been improving and changing to allow us to remove all manual steps that we have from the notification process. But we will get there eventually. And the, what we are trying to do now is to decrease the burden that we have on the doctor that suspects a disease and notifies it to the public health services, first at the local level, then at the regional, national, and then at the international level where we are here at TCDC. So when we can manage or the public health services can manage to access directly the health records and extract the information that is relevant for the diseases that we have under surveillance, we will definitely be able to automate some of the steps. So data can flow progressively and automatically from the doctor's desk to us at the CDC in an electronic format. If I understand well, the doctor reports data to the health authorities in each country. Do they do it in the same way? There's some degree of heterogeneity. The principles are the same. So there's a legislation that defines a list of diseases that are under surveillance and are of mandatory notification. But then 
the degree of digitalization is different in different countries. Some are still relying on old processes, but most countries have now uh, some kind of electronic reporting system that still requires some manual steps from the doctor to notify. And then the doctors, they report to ECDC and they report the same data, national health authorities. The doctor will always notify to the lower geographical level, so we will not receive notifications directly from a doctor at the CDC level, so they will notify to public health services at the local level, and then this can, in an automated, semi-automated or manual way, depends on the development of each country, it will progress to the regional level, to the national level, and then finally to the European level here at the CDC. Okay, and then what do you want to improve with this new project? One of the things that has been less than ideal with the current system we have is the burden that uh, notifying a disease to public health services represents to a doctor who is mostly concerned with treating a patient. So his main concern will be to have a proper diagnose, record whatever he needs in the clinical forms, define a treatment and follow up that patient. So when we ask a doctor to notify a case of disease to public health services, sometimes the impact is not seen immediately from the doctor. And this is what we, we want to improve with this digitalization, reducing the effort that we ask the doctor that he needs to notify a case of disease. And this burden to the doctor on the notification has different reflections. We can see it in different ways. One is a phenomena that we call under notification. Not all cases get notified because there's uh, this increased burden. The second is timeliness. Sometimes the cases accumulate and only after 10 cases uh, show up, the doctor will remember that he had to notify the cases. So we, with an automated system, we have the potential to improve timeliness. Then the final one uh, that will require still a lot of work is data quality. In principle, the data will be more complete with all the records that are available in the system and uh, there will be no forgetting about a specific detail that might be important for the notification. So are there data that we at the CDC don't have and that you would like to add to the record? That will depend a lot on the disease we're talking about and the availability of those records for, that were stored for clinical purposes. We, can you, can yeah. you give us an example? Yes, of course. So we're thinking, uh, for example, about measles. We have two types of surveillance. Maybe I should start by s defining this or distinguishing between indicator-based surveillance and event-based yes, surveillance. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. And the distinction here is that indicator-based surveillance is more structured. So it means that we have a defined set of variables that we will want to collect for a given disease. If we are talking about measles, for example, we will want to know the age of the patient, the sex at birth or gender. We will want to know where, in which region he lives, if he had fever or not, so a set of symptoms also that will allow us to confirm that this is an actual case, a set of lab results. So there's a... Um, and a, clinical data about this person. Also. Exactly, exactly. So the any signs, symptoms and lab tests that were performed or other results would be relevant. And then some epidemiological data that is also relevant, like the person had contact with another confirmed case of measles or not. This kind of data is, is quite relevant. And until now, we have been somewhat manually collecting these data at the CDC, and this, in principle, will improve when we get access uh, or the public health services get access to the clinical records that have been digitalized already and are in a health information. So system. you will have more information about the patient and his uh, clinical situation? We have the potential to get more data. Of course, we can say that if we have already a surveillance system in place, and for many diseases, all countries have the surveillance system set up and they know what data is relevant or the public health services know what data are relevant to each of the diseases. So they will have a form in the computer or in paper form where we will know the variables that the doctor should collect and report. This is not very complete sometimes, and this is where, where we expect to have um, an improvement because we will be able, or public health services will be able to look at, at the health records that have been digitalized and extract all the information that is relevant. On the other hand, it might come with a disadvantage, which is the system is not as flexible as a paper form where we, the public health services could just adapt or ask for an additional variable. So now we will have to focus on the data that are collected for clinical purposes. 
and see what from that is relevant for us for public health. You might face data protection challenge. How do you tackle this issue? Absolutely. Data protection is one of the main concerns, especially with clinical records, with anything that regards health, which is considered to be a special kind of data that has uh, specific rules for, for protection. This has been true already for the, the current surveillance systems because the data, clinical data is collected using a form. But now we're talking about more data potentially having access to or facing more uh, challenges in terms of data linkage, linking different data sources. So definitely there is something that we have to take into account in public health. There's uh, the GDPR regulation, uh, as you know, that uh, protects already and defines that the data belongs to the patient and data should not be used with the potential of harming the patient's confidentiality in any any way. And this is uh, obviously taken into account for public health purposes. But there's also an exception in this GDPR, which is... But this challenge also is about not recognizing an individual with his health data. Exactly. That's what we call anonymization. With health records, traditionally, there's a, a stage at which we have to anonymize data. This does not make sense at the doctor's office because he has to know who is the patient that is in front of, of him. So he needs uh, identifiable data. And in public health at the local level, when there is the need to go to the community and talk to the patient and talk to the contacts that he had in case there's, there was an infectious disease, the public health services will need to have access to identifiable data. But as soon as this data is transmitted to the next geographical levels, to the regional, national and international level, the data is anonymized or in a way all personal data is removed from the data set. So there's no threat to the patient's confidentiality. Now in the GDPR, what we have is an exception that is specifically for public health purposes. Whenever a case of a disease is a threat to the rest of the community, the public health services might need to get access to those data, even without the informed consent of the patient. But that this is something that we have, uh, have in place with specific rules for many years for the overall public health surveillance. I see. Why it's important to collect uh, clinical data? Clinical data is relevant in many levels. We've been talking about the first level, which is treating a patient. So patient's clinical data on symptoms or preconditions or other circumstances of the patient are relevant for his treatment to be diagnosed and then treated accordingly. He, there's the need to access his clinical data. Then there's the second layer when we're talking about surveillance. We need clinical data to be sure that we are talking about a given case of disease. We rely on clinical data to have what we call a case definition. So if we say we are talking about uh, COVID, for example, yeah, we will have a set of symptoms that are required for the patient to have for us to consider this a case of COVID. Then there's a laboratory criteria, meaning a lab result, which is also considered part of the clinical uh, information of the patient, and eventually other data. So this is relevant not only for the patient, for his doctor, but also for public health, for defining what is the case of the disease that we have under surveillance, and then to know exactly how severe the disease is. Does it kill a lot? It doesn't. Are the symptoms mild? So all these will have an impact in the way then public health decides to intervene. If this is a disease that kills 50% of the patients that have the infection, for instance, It's very severe, and obviously the intervention has to be according to that severity. So all clinical data and the outcomes will be really relevant for surveillance of the the infectious diseases. Now, the way we have access to this data is that's what's changing. So uh, at the moment, the data is not entirely collected automatically. There are human steps in this process. What is the time scale for this project? For the project we are working currently, which had a a time frame of four years, we do not expect to achieve full automation by the end of this period. We have started working on this project on the use of electronic health records for surveillance of infectious diseases in 2022, and we will end by 2026. And by then, we should evaluate the results we got and see what else we can do to improve even more digitalization of surveillance. 
but uh, what we aim to achieve is at least at this stage to test what we can use or countries can use from electronic health records. Is it enough to perform surveillance? Is it enough to fulfill the surveillance objectives that uh, we have set for the set of diseases? And by the end of the project, if we see there are additional things that we should explore and implement, then we will have other projects to continue working on digitalization of surveillance. So what are the different phases of this project? This project is all about the use of electronic health records for surveillance of infectious diseases. At ECTC, we have 56 diseases under surveillance, as you know. And for the project, we are exploring working specifically on three groups of diseases that we defined at the beginning of the project. The first we have been working on is respiratory infections, also because of the pandemic, obviously, it was quite important to start working on this and trying to improve surveillance. We noticed that during the pandemic, some of the surveillance systems of the traditional surveillance systems failed, and this is linked also to the increased burden in the healthcare services, of course. Of course. So th this one was the first that we decided to start working on. Then we included another one on blood infections, bloodstream infections. Can you give us an example? So whenever a patient gets hospitalized, it might need to receive some treatment that is given uh, directly to the blood. And in some circumstances, a bacteria might uh, grow and uh, the patient becomes sick just because of, uh, of this uh, bacteria that is uh, running at the, in the blood. Does it concern uh, nosocomial infections? Yes, it, inclu okay. it does include nosocomial infections, and it mostly we're talking about nosocomial infections, so acquired during the hospitalization, but in some circumstances it might be acquired uh, outside of the hospital. Okay. So this was the second group of diseases that we included, and then the, there was a third that we will start working now in 2024, focusing on sexually transmitted infections. Using these three groups of diseases, we thought that we would be covering some important aspects in terms of surveillance. So for the first one, we are talking more about a disease that is very common, uh, respiratory infections, as you know, especially during winter, COVID, influenza, and respiratory syncytial virus. So we're trying to see what is that we have in the hospital records that have been already digitalized that can be used for us to implement surveillance. Why did you choose those three groups of disease? The first that we included was about severe respiratory infections, and it was quite natural. We had been working already on improving surveillance systems for this kind of infections. Because they are the more frequent? or Because they have the potential to become pandemics, as we have seen in 2009 and, and yeah. now in, in 2020 with COVID. And because we need access to more data in a more timely way to be able to do some kind of intervention or prepare the healthcare services for what, what is coming. So clearly there was a gap there that uh, countries were mentioning when the pandemic came, the surveillance systems for acute respiratory infections failed in many circumstances because the resources were diverted to other things and notification of diseases was not a priority one. So the choice of the first group of diseases was quite easy. The next ones, we had some discussions internally at the CDC with the different teams and then with the countries to try to understand what would make sense to include. So we tried to select health conditions or diseases that cover different aspects. So we opted for bloodstream infections, for instance, because they are diagnosed mostly in the hospital during hospitalizations. And lab results are very important there. And there are some specificities of the lab results that we were interested in seeing if we could access through electronic health records. And I'm talking about resistance to antibiotics, for instance, which is a topic that is very important public health, as you know. So that's the justification for bloodstream infections. And many countries were already working on this and trying to improve their degree of automation and use of electronic health records. And the final one was sexually transmitted infections. And this one was also because it's a different group of diseases in terms of sensitivity, but a bit increased because it would allow us to test a situation where in many countries there's no need to hospitalization because of a sexually transmitted infection. The, the cases are treated in primary care or in specialized clinics. So for the other two groups of diseases, we will rely a lot on hospital records. And for sexually transmitted infections, we are starting now. So we you still don't know exactly what we will find. 
But in most countries, surveillance relies on primary care and specialty clinics, which is a different structure in health organization, and the health information systems are also different. So we want to test that and see uh, what are the results we can achieve. The initial steps of the project are to define with the countries a common surveillance protocol. And the surveillance protocol is nothing but a, a set of rules and variables that we expect or that we need to collect in order to achieve our surveillance objectives, which usually f- for most diseases, these surveillance objectives are monitoring trends, knowing how severe the disease is, and uh, evaluating the impact of any intervention, such as vaccination or non-pharmaceutical interventions, whatever is defined by the public health services. So this is the first step, defining this common generic protocol. Then from here, we will work on the countries as we know that there's some degree of heterogeneity, not only between countries, but also in each country, between regions, and sometimes in each region, between different local levels. Of course. We will have to, or countries will work with our support on defining their own country-specific surveillance protocol. It should be based on the generic surveillance protocol that we have worked on, but then with, with some specific aspects that can be adapted to their own situation. How do you help them to harmonize their uh, health systems? So for this project, we have the support of an external contractor, the Issuer Consortium, uh, led by EpiConcept. So they have been working with us to support countries. We set up meetings, bilateral meetings with the countries to uh, assess the situation and, and discuss the, the issues. Then we have uh, multilateral meetings with the participation of different countries where countries can present their own experience, learn lessons, identify good practices. And uh, with that, we can not only improve the national surveillance systems, but also reach a higher degree of harmonization and then consequently have a a better EU level surveillance. The next step would be to have maybe a system that allows the automatic collection of data. Yes. Even before that, we will want to have a surveillance report. So it's not only about defining what variables we want to collect. We want to define a set of indicators that we want to monitor. And for that, we will need to define. We will have uh, surveillance reports by the end of each year where countries can present the results they achieved with this new kind of surveillance for that specific disease. Then what we want to do is compare this new type of surveillance with the old surveillance method and see what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what is it that can be used and how we can improve. If we identify any areas where we see that we cannot replace the old system yet, the countries will not replace their, their old system, we'll continue working in parallel. But then When this new system is uh, fully running, we expect that we are able, or countries are able, to completely rely on electronic health records and improve or add to the automated steps and decrease the number of manual steps. In any case, for the last step, which is the notification of cases from the national level to ECDC, this will be the last step in, in this project. We hope that we can automate all steps in the lower geographical levels first, but we will rely still on the uh, when the data reaches the national public health level, then there's a manual notification to us at ECDC for now. And then in the future, we'll see how we, this can be also automated. So what are the benefits for uh, European countries to have this digitalization of data? The main benefits, at least for, for now, we hope that the, they will be seen by the national level. and the, They will be the ones that will have access in a more timely way to the data they need to fulfill their surveillance objectives. So this is the first one. Then from the project, by understanding better what ha- other countries have been doing and what were the challenges they faced, they will also be able to improve. It doesn't have to be legal challenges that we talked about before, but also technical challenges in terms of data collection, data linkage between different data sources. So we hope that uh, during this project we can uh, identify which uh, practices are the best and the countries can can also benefit from that. Is there a, a digital platform with all health data of all European countries? Each country can access? No, not yet. This is actually another initiative th- that is ongoing, which is called the European Health Data Space. But we will not probably have time to talk a lot about that. 
With this project, we will not define or create a new platform for collection of data, no. The countries already have their national databases, their national surveillance systems where they store their data for infectious diseases. And what will change is the way they can populate these databases, the way they can get access to the data they need. So okay, and then they can also uh, compare with other countries or follow trends in exactly. other countries. They will be able to compare with uh, the historical way of collecting the data and see if the results improved or not, and then compare with different countries and see what they can work on. Okay. As a European citizen, how do I benefit from this digital uh, surveillance? In public health, it is very difficult to identify immediate benefits because we're talking about protecting health and protecting the well-being of the citizens. So it's not that we can say, I was sick and now I'm healthy. No, but maybe if I travel to another country and I fall sick, uh, the general practitioner will be able to request data if it's urgent, for example. That's what the European health data space is about. Exactly, okay. exactly that. So But the, this is another project. It's another project. That is very important. It's about the primary use of the health data, meaning a, a patient can travel from one country to another and still can have access to his own records. So a doctor in another country might be able to access, access the clinical records. With the authorization of the patient. With, with the informed consent of the patient, obviously so they can access and provide care in a different country. This is primary use of health data. This project that we have been talking about is about secondary use of health data. Secondary because we are reusing the health data for another purpose that was not okay. the initial purpose that we collected data. So the example you gave is what European health data space is about, and we hope that in the coming years we can collect some benefits of that system being set up But uh, we will be focusing on the secondary use. And this yes, uh, secondary use can mean two different things. One is public health and another one is research. Public health has a different legal framework because the, the information from one patient is relevant to prevent a disease in another patient. Mm -hmm. So the legal framework is slightly different. But then there's research too which in the end, uh, the, the overall goal is the same, to know more about a disease, to know more about risk factors, and to be able to support decision-making. But uh, the legal framework there will require probably ethical uh, review and other steps that for public health purposes, uh, that's not needed. What is the CDC added value in this project? So at TCDC, one of our main goals is to support member states improving their surveillance systems. And uh, we provide defined guidelines that can be used. For most diseases, we have a network that all countries participate in those networks. And we are in a position where we can try to provide recommendations to countries, taking into account the lessons learned and what we see works for the EU uh, surveillance level. So we can interact with these networks and improve. Now, from this project, we will have frequent moments of uh, dialogue with all the countries. We have these multilateral meetings that are very frequent for the different diseases. We will work on uh, improving surveillance objectives for the different diseases. And we know that surveillance objectives are the starting point for data collecting. We need to justify why we want to collect a given set of data. And this is always linked with the health indicators that allow us to monitor if we are achieving or not our surveillance objectives. So we've been working at the CDC for a long time on this. Now what is changing is the tools are different and the access to the data will be different. And hopefully we will be able to provide the guidelines and the recommendations that countries ask us. One of our goals is also to achieve a harmonization. Countries have been reaching out to us and saying we have different systems in place, even in, if in our own country. So which system is better? What approach should we take? How can we link data? And all this is something that we will be in a position to provide recommendations to countries and, and hopefully improve.
When you have uh, reached your goal on these three groups of disease, will you apply this to other groups? That's not planned yet because we really want to know, understand first what is it that we can achieve through this project. But definitely a goal for the future will be to expand the use of electronic health records for surveillance of other diseases. We are not sure yet that we are going to be able to fulfill the surveillance objectives for the 56, or at least we know it, it will require time. But for many diseases, the, the principles are the same and the type of access that we'll, countries will need to healthcare records will be the same. So we hope that uh, the progress will be faster after this project expanding to surveillance to other diseases. What are your future plans? Do you plan to use AI, for example? Artificial intelligence is something that is trending nowadays and uh, has been or is being currently explored by everyone for very different tasks. And we see a use of AI for surveillance too. At TCDC, there's already a team that has been uh, working on this and trying to explore the use of artificial intelligence for event-based surveillance. So for, to try to screen media understand if there are signals that can be relevant for us or for public health services in general. But this is more focusing on event-based surveillance, as I was saying. Now for indicator-based surveillance, which is what our project is about, we are still not including it. We didn't start working on it, but we see definitely a lot of utility of this uh, new tool in the future. One of the things that it can be used is about uh, interpreting the data as it is. Uh, when we talk about uh, clinical records, I was mentioning before that a doctor might record everything in the same open field where everything... With free text. With free text, with typos, with information that is really difficult to interpret. Even if you're talking about uh, a machine, we need to define an algorithm that allows us to say, if you see this text, then the diagnosis is the disease that we have under surveillance. Okay. So defining algorithms is the first step, and we are doing that already. But the next step will be to have a machine to interpret those uh, unstructured data for us. So artificial intelligence, especially for this kind of interpretation, is, is quite relevant. But then we can think about also the next step, which is the notification, the flow of data from the different levels to, uh, until they reach ECDC. And then at the ECDC level, also to make sense of the data we receive, generate outputs, all these might benefit a lot from artificial intelligence. So we're looking forward to this new tool and next one. Okay, it looks promising. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos, for this interesting conversation. It's uh, very important for all citizens. This project will have a lot uh, of impact on each of us in Europe. So thank you for uh, explaining all the steps of the project and uh, all the challenge you face. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast about surveillance of infectious disease, digital surveillance in particular. If you would like to know more, please visit our website tcdc.europa.eu or follow us for the latest news on social media.